So John Reed, I think you are from UK these days. This week. This week. And he is a clinical psychologist and professor in psychology and do research about the connection between social political issues and mental health. Maybe that is a good summary? Okay. Hi. Um, normally when you take part in research, uh, it takes three years before you find out the results. Here's the results of the research we did uh, this afternoon. Um, so this is a sample of, the, of, of what, uh, what you have said, <coughs> which might be useful when we do a press release tomorrow to sort of let the media know who was here and that, those sorts of things. So, a slower, yes, I can. 35% of us have taken psychiatric drugs, 35% of us present. Of those people, 86% have attempted to withdraw at some point. And of those people, 67% experienced difficulties withdrawing, but 33% did not, which is reminds us that everybody is different and not everybody finds it extraordinarily uh, difficult, although many will. So, And uh, in terms of do we need an international institute for psychiatric drug withdrawal, 80% of you said yes, 15% were not sure, and 5% said no, but we know where you live, <laughs> and we have a, a drug for you <laughs> that will help you uh, experience the truth. So, um, Karina said, would you go last, John, because uh, we need someone to end the conference on a positive note. And I thought, perhaps Karina doesn't know me quite as well as uh, I thought she did. Because <laughs> I'm, I'm not necessarily a positive person on these issues, but I will, I will try um, not to leave you all too much doom and gloom. But the, the, the point of talking about these issues is to remind us about what gets covered up by the medical model, by this simplistic, pessimistic view, uh, biological view about what causes human distress. Yes, the drugs are damaging. Yes, the diagnoses are unscientific and unhelpful and stigmatizing. And we've covered all of that quite well today, but let's not forget what gets buried under the medical model. How psychiatry colludes with doing nothing about the true causes of human distress. This is a broader sociopolitical issue. There is a collusion going on, I think, within our mental health services, a collusion around child abuse, a collusion about poverty and inequality and homelessness and all of the things that we really need to be addressing. But if the healers, our appointed healers, say these things are not important, these things are not what's causing distress, then there's no pressure on our politicians to do anything about them. And I think that's bordering on criminal. So that's my job today. Um, and here's the, a very simplistic overview of the talk, or something to think about. If the causes of human distress, disorientation, and despair are genetic flaws and chemical imbalances, then perhaps drugs are the answer. If, however, the causes of human distress, disorientation, and despair are mostly to be found in negative human interactions, just perhaps the answer is positive human interactions. <laughs> Call me simple. <laughs> and it is more complex than that, I understand, but sometimes in all the statistics, and I am going to bore you with some more statistics and research, but sometimes we can lose sight of the bleeding obvious, as we say in, in, in England. So, right. Some advertising. Uh, please do think about coming to join us in Liverpool next year for our big international... Society for Psychological and Social Approaches to Psychosis. And most of you will also know about the Hearing Voices Network, so, which is one of the most exciting things that's happened in 20 years of, uh, in the last 20 years, along with open dialogue. Um, and a lot of the ideas that I'm going to be talking about very quickly today, a lot of the research behind some of the claims I'm going to be making are found in more detail in, in our book, Models of Madness. So before we talk about what actually does cause madness and, and distress, let's just have a quick look at what the public thinks, because we lose sight of this. The public is already on our side. It's important to remember that. In studies all over the world, in all of these countries, when you ask the public what causes mental health problems, including psychosis or schizophrenia, 
Uh, in all of these countries, they say bad things happening. They say poverty, loneliness, distress, neglect, child abuse, stress at home, stress in family, unemployment, and so forth. Uh, they include biogenetic factors as well. They're not stupid. They have a multifactorial model, as we would call it. Um, but it's way down the bottom of the list. So biology and genetics is in there, but it's definitely considered less important than all these other things. There is one country <coughs> that where the research has been done. It's not Sweden. And the results were different, but it's a country that just can't help itself. It gets everything wrong. Um, so we won't mention that. Well, we, well, we will. We won't. Sorry, Will, I know you'll forgive me. Um, but it's all right, Donald Trump will fix that, I'm sure. I don't believe I could even make a joke about Donald Trump. Sorry, it's not funny. But isn't that interesting? You can, it's important to hold on to that, I think, that the public, despite 20 or 30 years of propaganda telling them to believe that mental illnesses are illnesses like any other, they will not let go of this idea that bad things happen and they fuck us up. They, that's where the average person, not everybody, but the vast majority of people in all these countries. And then when you look at people who have received the diagnosis themselves, um, they have an even stronger psychosocial view than the average person, uh, average member of the public. So here's a study of 297 306, out of 306 typical schizophrenics, whatever that means, um, refused to accept a medical model. They did not believe they had anything wrong with them. They understood their difficulties in terms of, their, in terms of life events. This was conducted by um, Robin Murray, who is considered the, um, one of the possibly British, the British, most prominent British uh, schizophrenia researcher. Um, and these people's beliefs were instantly dismissed as lack of insight which was then interpreted as a symptom of the illness that they refuse to accept they have, but that the psychiatrist says they do have. I find this just a tad arrogant. And then it gets really entertaining because they have now identified the part of the brain that causes you to disagree with your psychiatrist. You couldn't make this up, could you? If you wrote this in a novel, it would just like, or oh, yes. It's called anosognosia and it causes you to disagree with your psychiatrist, and that is a symptom of schizophrenia, disagreeing with your psychiatrist. Yeah, laugh or cry, I will laugh. We'll la you, we'll do laughing today, not crying, is that right? You, you, yeah. We'll find that funny today, not sad. <laughs> Contrast that with uh, the average UK psychiatrist view, um, and you have 100 for every one psychiatrist in Britain who agrees with their patients, you have 115 who disagree. And that's, that's, that actually is sad, because now you've got an interaction between someone who genuinely wants help and who genuinely thinks that their problems are caused by life events and they want to tell their story, meeting someone who genuinely wants to help but has been trained not to listen, or more accurately, has been trained to listen just enough so they can count how many symptoms somebody has got so they can decide which color pill to prescribe on the basis of what label. And I think that's sad for both, both people in that meeting, in that meeting place. So here's a non-contentious way to, to put the question, who is right? Millions of people all over the world, including service users, et cetera, et cetera, or biological psychiatrists and drug company executives? This is a neutral way to put the question, um, I realize. I wouldn't want to polarize this issue at all in, in, in any way. Um, of course, the answer is there is no single cause. Like anything else, people, people are not simple, are they? They're complicated. These are the things we actually do know. There's question marks over the top two. We'll come back to them. I'm not going to go through all of these. And it isn't any one of them by itself. It's an accumulation of, of things that increase the chances of ending up with serious mental health difficulties. It is important to, to note that there actually isn't any evidence of genetic predispositions to any page of the DSM, um, largely because there's no reliability to most of the constructs, so it's hard to find a single cause for things that actually don't exist scientifically. But um, here's the NIM NIMH uh, saying some time back now that uh, reanalyzing data on 14,000 patients and finding that there's a strong association between the number of stressful life events and risk of depression. That's staggering, isn't it? So 
this is a revolutionary idea, so write this down, but hide it away in case anybody sees it, because it's very radical. This is the idea that depression, I'm going to say it quietly, depression is caused by depressing things happening. Okay. But more importantly, in this, in, in this context, there was no relationship to uh, a supposed genetic predisposition. So it was entire, they were looking for the, that classic interaction between genes and environment. Um, it was all explained in terms of um, adverse life events. There is also no evidence of a genetic predisposition for anything called schizophrenia. So this is uh, American Journal of Psychiatry, uh, reanalyzing a number of studies and finding that the distribution of test statistics suggests nothing outside of what would be expected by chance. That's obviously a whole, to dismiss all of that in one slide is a bit cheeky, but we haven't got time to dwell on it. Um, just be open to the idea that this is, there actually isn't any evidence for a genetic predisposition to specific mental disorders. So what, what does the evidence suggest are the actual causes? Well, the strongest predictor statistically of everything in mental health is poverty. Yes, I'm going to talk about child abuse and neglect, but statistically the most powerful predictor of pretty much everything is, is poverty, except for relative poverty, which we now know is even uh, a, a more powerful predictor. That This is the difference between the top 10% uh, income and the bottom 10%. And again, the good old USA comes out best. Um, so this is the extent of the inequality. This is the frequency of uh, severe mental illness. Uh, the UK, this is a few years old now, so the UK is trying hard to catch up with the USA with its cuts. Um, and let's not talk about Brexit because I'll get, need some antidepressants very quickly if I think too hard about that. Italy, just never include Italy in your research. They just will not fit in with just outliers. Just forget it. But you can see overall a fairly strong... Um, that suggests there's a psychological component to poverty. It's not just the lack of enough money. It's how you feel about that poverty relative to very, very wealthy people. In terms of uh, childhood abuse, which is what I've done most of my research on, if we just look at the overall picture first of all, this is women in New Zealand, the relationship between uh, sexual abuse as a child, which included intercourse or attempted intercourse, 25 times more likely to have tried to kill themselves and 12 times more likely to end up in a psychiatric hospital. These are the sorts of things that are not spoken about because of our overemphasis on biology and genetics and neurotransmitters and so forth. The long-term effects of child abuse are many. I don't expect I need to dwell on those too long. Just the prevalence alone, regardless of what causes what, the prevalence of people who have been sexually and physically abused in our inpatient units around the world. Um, as I say, this doesn't prove causation. It, it suggests that maybe we should be paying attention. Maybe we should be asking people if this has happened to them, and maybe they might want to talk about that or not. But the dismissal of reactions to child abuse and calling it, these are symptoms of some spasm in your midbrain that's got nothing to do with your life events, that makes me upset. It's not okay. And it's particularly not okay because these are our healers. These are not our butchers and grocers and news agents. These are our healers who are saying that child abuse is not relevant to people's distress. And that if you include other types of child maltreatment, the figures if you add it all together, start getting up to 80%, 90%. And it's not all about bad things that people do to one another. Life does have things that are inevitable and, and do happen. So first episode psychosis, 12 times more likely to have lost mum in the first eight years of life. Again, by itself, doesn't necessarily cause anything. But it's one factor. And it's a factor that maybe we should pay attention to as well. So overall, however you measure severity of disturbance, people within our mental health services who were abused as child, all of these things are true of, of them. The 
this is the study that I, I'm rather mean and, and like to cite. Um, I, th I think, Olga, you showed this earlier today, I think. Um, this is cherry picking. This is genuine cherry picking. This is the strongest study. It's the one I like to take to psychiatry conferences with me. Um, because this is a study, as Olga said, as where people who had experienced five types of childhood adversity were 193 times more likely to be diagnosed with psychosis. And then I mean and ask them to pre pre present in return anything from the entire biogenetic research field for the last 100 years that comes anywhere close to the strength of that sort of finding. And of course they, they can't. But overall, if we're, more, if we're more fair and look at all the studies combined, what we, and this is the meta-analysis that we put out in 2012 of the 41 best studies. Overall, after you've controlled for all the possible intervening variables like poverty and so forth, um, childhood adversity, um, three, you're three times more likely to end up with psychosis if you've experienced some sort of childhood adversity. That's what the meta-analysis looks like. I want to try and explain that to you. Uh, I'll put it that way instead. Those are the six types of childhood adversity that there are, were enough studies on um, to include in the meta-analysis. And this is the, the odds ratio for each of them. Um, this is beginning to become a bit of a pattern now in studies that in a, a lot of studies, it's the, the emotional abuse is even more predictive of bad outcomes than sexual abuse and physical abuse. That's not to minimize sexual and physical abuse. It's to remind us that for some people being told you are shit day after day after day can be more damaging than one or two rather awful incidents of uh, a one-off incidents. So we shouldn't forget those. Now, of course, the brain is important. It's not all social. What I object to is, is a brain research, what I call brain research in a social vacuum, and other speakers today have talked about the importance to include context when we're looking, trying to understand the biology. But this is the slide where I have to, um, in every psychiatry conference, schizophrenia conference, that I've been to for the last 30 years, you know when, when you're watching a horror film, your favorite horror film, there'll be the one bit where you have to hide under the chair because you can't quite look at it. It's just too awful. This is the slide where I have to hide behind my chair because it makes me so angry because of how it's presented. This is presented as evidence that schizophrenia is a brain disease. You can see it. There's the brain. It's smaller. It's got bigger ventricles. Therefore, it's a brain disease. Therefore, it has nothing to do with the person's life event. I'm not exaggerating. This has been portrayed for many, many years as evidence. And it is kind of convincing. As long as you forget the answer to the question that I always ask at these conferences, because I can't help myself. I'm like a little robot. And I put my hand up <laughs> and I say, excuse me, excuse me, what do you think a brain is for? And they look around and, oh dear, there's a weirdo in the house. <laughs> and I say, well, I'll make it a bit easier for you. What good would a brain be that didn't respond to the environment? Yeah. Oh, that's interesting. No, no, this is a psychiatry conference, so we're not, we're not going there, John. So in every other branch of neurology where they're looking at brains, it's the first question they ask when they find differences between two groups of people. What happened to this group? In psychiatry, no. In psychiatry, here is the evidence that this is a brain disease. In 2001, we put out a paper to try and speak to these researchers because by then, for the first time, we knew what was going on in the brains of traumatized young children. To be fair to them, before then, we actually didn't know. It was in the 1990s that the, some of the best research, the first research was done looking at the brains of traumatized children. And we wanted to see if there was any um, similarities at all between this standard list that we all, in all our textbooks, whether you're a social worker or a nurse or a psychologist, this is the basic list of differences between the brains of schizophrenic people and normal people. And we wanted to see if there was any similarity at all between this and what was going on in the brains of traumatized children. This is what we found. I'll do that again. <laughs> You understand? 
Um, I'm pleased to say that this, this paper has been cited uh, six or seven hundred times. I think it is beginning. Some of these people are finding it more difficult to stand up in front of audiences and say, here is the evidence that it's a brain disease. Um, and I think it's less controversial these days, the relationship between childhood abuse and uh, psychosis and schizophrenia. Um, implications for treatment, um, which of course have been covered by other speakers, but I feel obliged to say something about what all this means, um, although it's quite obvious, really, I think, probably to people in the room. Let's start again with what the public think, just to remind ourselves, because there's lots of surveys been done asking the public about whether they uh, think talking treatments or medication is best, including for schizophrenia, and in all of those countries, People say talking treatments are best. That's what I would like if I become depressed or schizophrenic. That's what I'd like for my daughter or my son. So, yes, people are beginning more and more to show up at the doctor asking for pills. Yes, that is true. But, but there are many people who actually, if given half a chance, will say, actually, doctor, I'd really like to talk to someone, please. But, yes, there is a culture of, of, of expecting medication, but we shouldn't forget this. Again, the USA is a, on another planet on, on that one. To be fair to the USA, it's not a coincidence that the USA is the one, uh, one of the two places on earth when the, where the drug companies can advertise direct to consumer. So next time you're in America and you're in your hotel room, put the tally on and count. Is it one in three advertisements that are drug company ads or one in four? It's the total bombardment endlessly. So it's kind of, and it does eventually take its toll on people's beliefs. So, in, in terms of just one or two bits and pieces around uh, medication, I uh, just thought, uh, since Denmark and Sweden love to compete with one another, I thought I'd tell, let you know where you are on the league tables at the moment on antidepressant prescriptions. So, Sweden needs to work a little bit harder to catch up with Denmark. You're, you're, but you're only number five in the world. As we've heard already from, from Bob, uh, it's 20% uh, in the States are on some sort of... Uh, at psychiatric medication. One in eight um, are on antidepressants. We must always remember that you've got to increase that for women if you want to know what's going on for women because certainly antidepressants are prescribed to women twice as often as men. So if it's, the figure is one in eight for the general population, it's one in six, one in five for women. So I think we can call this an epidemic. Would we, was that a reasonable? Was that a bit radical? There's a lot of it. Let's call it that. We can agree on that. And just to, uh, up to date, these things are happening more often these days. For decades, as Bob and Peter will tell you, for, for decades, the drug companies used to settle out of court. So these things never came to light. And they can easily settle out of court because they have millions and millions of dollars or pounds. Nowadays, it's uh, coming into, into court more often. Here's the most recent one. Uh, just last week, a jury awarded nearly 12 million dollars in a suicide case for paroxetine. How can, it, how can it be that we have to go to the course of our land that, that the people prescribing them won't accept that these things are causing suicide? We have to go to a court. And I think it's right that we go to court. We need to do this more and more and more because this is a profession that is not evidence-based. They are not going to respond to the evidence they may respond to the fact that what they're doing is illegal and immoral and gets punished, but 11 million to a drug company, that's like Thursday afternoon's profit. It's nothing. But at least it's in the public domain and it, there's, a, there's a sense of justice to these sorts of findings. Are they rare? Is it rare that these drugs cause people to feel suicidal? Well, we did the largest survey of people actually on antidepressants. It's not a sophisticated survey. It's not a random sample. It's an online survey. But it was the largest survey ever. 55% of people had tried to come off these drugs and experienced withdrawal effects. What percentage does it need to be before we can use the term addictive? I, I would say that that's up there. Um, these people themselves, only 27% of them described themselves as addicted to the drugs. But this included people who had only been on a few months as well as people who had been on 10 years. 
the drug companies and uh, the Royal College of Psychiatry, the American Psychiatric Association are all saying very strongly these drugs are not addictive. Which is what we heard about benzodiazepines for the first 20 years, isn't it? 20 years they lied to us about benzodiazepines and they knew. I assume, I'm not an addiction expert, I assume addiction can be seen as a dimension. Some drugs could be more addictive. Um, so maybe they're not as addictive as benzodiazepines, I'm, I'm no expert, but I think we have an issue here. 55% are saying when they try to come off, they're experiencing withdrawal effects. And in terms of the suicidality, 39% said they experienced the drugs as making them feel more suicidal than they were before. That's not rare, is it? How can we, how did we get in this situation that we're prescribing drugs for people who are depressed that make them feel more suicidal? How could, again, you couldn't make it up. You couldn't write a bad novel where the healers of a society prescribe things to people who are upset that make them more upset. How, well, and we have to, if we're going to change this, we have to understand how this came about and what the barriers are. We are currently just f following up that New Zealand study. We're doing an international one now, um, which covers antidepressants and antipsychotics. And I'd like you to scribble that down, please, and send it out so that Sweden is well represented in this survey. Um, I'll put it back up again at the end. Psychmedicationsurvey.com. Please just send it to all your networks. It's another online survey. Um, and we want to get the largest international um, sample ever. So, um, on antipsychotics, um, there's experts in the room that make me hesitate to even touch the subject with Volkmar and Bob and Peter in the room. <laughs> I'll just put up one slide and I'll let Cochrane speak for itself. Um, this is a Cochrane review of Respiridone, 2010. I'll simply read it. Risperidone appears to have a marginal benefit in terms of clinical improvement compared with placebo in the first few weeks of treatment, but the margin may not be clinically meaningful. And Peter's already explained to us that clinically meaningful means can somebody see it? A patient or a doctor or a nurse or a relative. Um, global effects suggest there is no clear difference between risperidone and placebo. This is a Cochrane review. This is not John Reed. This is not some anti-psychiatry organization. This is a Cochrane review. Obviously, it highlights the adverse effects which we know about, including shortening lifespan. We have a branch of medicine that compulsorily, can compulsorily make people take chemicals that shorten their lifespan. What the f*** is going on? What I, how did... Sorry, it still makes me... Cross. And then usually Cochrane reviews end with, those of you who've read many Cochrane reviews and, and Peter, they usually end with something like, well, on the one hand and on the other hand, and we need more research, the research, we don't want to take a view on this because it's, we need more, more quality research. This one ended with people with schizophrenia or their advocates may want to lobby regulatory authorities to insist on better studies being available before wide release of a compound with the subsequent beguiling advertising. <laughs> this is a Cochrane review. This is our frontline treatment for our most distressed and confused people in our society. It's not acceptable. The, a simplistic explanation, because we all play our part, and this is not just the drug companies, and I actually hold the drug companies less responsible than psychiatry, because it's the drug company's job to make a profit for their shareholders. And we know when people are trying to make a profit, they put out advertisements, we know their lies, don't we? We don't really think Purcell is whiter than white. Yes, it would be nice if our drug companies were more ethical, but my anger and frustration is directed at the profession of psychiatry who has lost sight of what a proper professional and ethical boundary is between itself and a profit-making organization. A third of the income of the American Psychiatric Association is drug company. 
money. And the idea that they're not influenced by that is absurd. The, so we have to speak about the elephant in the room if, we know, if we're going to identify what we're up against, if we're going to win this battle. Um, the influence is pretty much everywhere, including, of course, the internet, where most people get their information from these days. We did a study not so long ago just of the top 50 schizophrenia websites. Surprise, surprise, more than half are drug company funded. This is where people are getting the information. And unsurprisingly, the drug companies talk about schizophrenia as a debilitating, devastating, long-term, biologically-based, genetically predisposed illness from which nobody ever recovers. But if you take your medication, you might one day get a part-time job, sort of, possibly, probably not. <laughs> I'm thinking of Olga now and the things that you were told, Olga, which makes me cross also. So, yeah, um, here's some... I'm trying to be more positive. I always do what Karina tells me. You have no idea how powerful Karina is. Some of us were sat around yesterday morning having breakfast in the hotel, and one of us had the temerity to say to the other five, what, what are we here for? What, what, what are we doing today? And the rest of us, we don't know. Karina just said we should be here. <laughs> that's not quite true. She did give us some idea, but that's, that's my way of acknowledging how in such high regard we we, we hold you. So Karina has told me to be positive, so here's some positive, some positive bits. If senior psychiatrists can name the elephant in the room, then so can we, and we must keep naming it. Stephen Sharfstein, president of the American Psychiatric Association, said over 10 years ago now, if we are seen as mere pill pushers and employees of the pharmaceutical industry, our credibility as a profession is compromised. As we address these big pharma issues, we must examine the fact that as a profession, we have allowed the biopsychosocial model to become the bio, bio, bio model. This is not a, gr a group of angry ex-psych patients. This is the president of the American Psychiatric Association. Uh, meanwhile, his counterpart in Britain, the head of the Royal College um, of Psychiatrists, put the same issue a little more succinctly. Mike Shooter wrote, I cannot be the only person to be sickened by the sight of parties of psychiatrists standing at the airport desk with so many gifts with them, they might as well have the name of the drug company tattooed across their foreheads. <laughs> this is the head of the British psychiatrist. This is brave, brave people, good people, psychiatrists. This is, this is the point where I make the terrible bad joke that nobody ever gets that goes, some of my best friends are psychiatrists. No, I must stop making that joke because it doesn't work. I just, <laughs> somebody gets it. Um, we're nearly there. Um, this, this is just to remind me to tell a story about how organised the drug companies are because I've put out a few reviews now that this literature about childhood trauma and psychosis. 2008, this new journal started, a very, very biological journal, Clinical Schizophrenia, and they asked me would I do another review, and I said no, thank you, that's enough now. People will either get it or not. And they then tried to persuade me to do it by telling me that their journal goes free to the 20,000 psychiatrists in America who are most involved with schizophrenia. And when you're a bit grandiose like me and you think you're some kind of social change agent sent by God to save the world from psychiatry, um, that's hard to say no to, you know? So, so, so I did. Um, and then I thought, how do they know? How do they know which the 20,000 psychiatrists? And when they told me the answer, I felt so naive. They said, that's easy, John. The drug companies every year send us a list in order, ranked, of the 20,000 psychiatrists who prescribe the most antipsychotic medication in the previous 12 months. That's how organized they are. That's how good their research is. We have to match that. With slightly less resources. <laughs> good luck to us, but we, I'm sure we will. Okay, finally then, so the implications for primary <coughs> prevention. We've talked about the implications for, you know, these drugs are doing not very good things to people then, certainly not helping people get better, but there are broader implications, aren't there, as I, as I tried to allude to at the beginning of my talk. If we think back to those, that meta-analysis where I put up a list of the six types of childhood adversity that the meta-analysis looked at, 
including bullying and death and parental death and so forth, we were able to do a calculation um, called the estimated population attributable risk, which is a statistical game you can play, which tells you if you could magically get rid of those six types of childhood adversity, which of course we can't, but if we could, 33% of psychosis would just disappear. And we also, in our struggles, we must, I think, um, stay tuned into those broader issues as, as well as the uh, individual people that are, we're trying to, to help. There's a primary prevention issue here. And before I finish on the issue of um, staying positive in all of this, I, 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 people often ask me at the end of talks like this, and please don't ask me this, I find it so depressing. People say, well, so what are we going to do to make it all change, John? I've been trying this for 40 years. I am the last person to ask how to make a change because if I knew, I would. all we can do is maybe keep speaking truth to power. But in terms of the way I cope with it, I have a little man inside my head, a little voice that speaks to me, and his name is Gramsci, who was an Italian um, socialist, and he wrote from prison about um, how he dealt with the world in terms of holding on to pessimism of the intellect and optimism of the heart. And I like that. It means you can believe and hope that things can get better while not turning yourself into a moron. That <laughs> You can still keep looking at how bad things are, looking directly and honestly at them and naming them and hold on to that hope that if enough people can also see that and if we work together, we can change things. So that's how I cope. Um, it's a cognitive distortion or a delusion or whatever, but it works for me. So don't try and medicate that out of me. <laughs> so I'll end, with a, I'll end with a hero. I have many villains. Uh, here's a hero, who, George Orby, who was president of the American Psychological Association for many years. Unfortunately, he's the sort of guy that if you turn his head upside down, he looks exactly the same. <laughs> But we can't, we can't help, he can't help that. Uh, he spent most of his time telling us psychologists off for putting all our energy in at the bottom of the cliff and not highlighting the true causes of human distress and allowing this medical model to go unchallenged. And, and, and on that, can I just remind us that psychiatry are a tiny, tiny percentage of the mental health workforce. And biological psychiatrists are about half of that. We are the majority by far, and you remember what the public thinks, what most mental health workers think, just hold on to that fact, that we are way in the majority. That's important to hold on to. I'll end with George, this is my last, last slide, i almost on time. It's another way I keep myself going, is by this quote from George. We must join with persons who reject racism, sexism, colonialism and exploitation and must find ways to redistribute social power and to increase social justice. Primary prevention research inevitably will make clear the relationship between social pathology and psychopathology and then will work to change social and political structures in the interests of social justice. It is as simple and as difficult as that. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, John. Thank you so much, John.